This, this is awesome. Thanks for coming out. Um, so let's first, I thought I would know more people here. I don't know. This is a little uh, humbling. How many people have been to a clinic, trained with me, kind of have hung out with me in the past? Two people? <laughs> humbling. Okay. So, uh, so th that's fine. Um, the big... The big thing here is that I've got a lot of content and a lot of stuff that we got to clean up in terms of training for Ultimate. So, uh, you know, I'm going to probably go for an hour, and then we have this room till 11:30. So, if you guys have questions at the end, write down your questions. Make sure you ask them. If you have questions in the middle, if you're like Timmy, what in the heck are you talking about? Just raise your hand. Okay, we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll try to make this a little. It's an intimate little group, so we'll try to make it uh, kind of just do our thing. So. The, how many of you guys are from Boston? All right, so you guys live in my backyard. I, I think it's real important, given the intimacy of this community, the ultimate community, the Boston community, that I tell my story so you guys know kind of why I'm up here telling you, uh, you know, what not to do and what to do. Because, um, you know, I've, I've trained a lot. I've made a lot of mistakes. And uh, you guys are, are going to see, uh, see that today. So I'm going to go through. We're, we're going to talk about... We're going to talk about uh, my story, and then we're going to go through six quick little misconceptions, and then we're going to dive in deep to static stretching, yoga, bodybuilding style training, stair workouts, and track workouts. We're going to talk about self-myofascial release. We're going to talk about plyometrics. We're going to talk about physical therapy, and then we're going to talk about CrossFit. Um, so let's do this. This is me. This is, uh, this is pretty much my college experience in a nutshell. I was a Beach Patrol lifeguard. I was the hippie kid with a gallon of water and uh, a skateboard and a disc. I didn't really wear shirts very often. That's, uh, that's what my college uh, you know, experience was. Uh, and I played for Buzz Ultimate. Buzz Ultimate was the love of my college uh, experience. These guys were, uh, were everything to me. And in 2007, 2008, I was captain with Alex Joukowsky. That's my boy, AJ, up in the corner. We also do beach patrol together. So you guys will be seeing a lot of him if you follow the kind of stuff I do. These are my ultimate mentors. I played three years medicine in Baltimore. Uh, Farrell Sullivan was my coach. Bill Mill, Mike Steffen, Ryan Vance were uh, my, my mentors on, on MedMen. And on Buzz, Justin Miyagi, just a nasty Handler, or I'm sorry, Nasty Defender, Jake Bell, Nasty Handler, Kevin Moldenhauer, who's now the coach of uh, whatever AUDL, AUDL, the MLU team is in. Uh, uh, anybody know what Kevin's coaching? Is it the, the DC Current, which is MLU, or AUDL? Okay, so Kevin was my summer league coach in Baltimore and big influence on me. Um, so my style, man, I had to train really hard. I had to try really hard to be good at ultimate. I didn't start playing until 2005, you know, competitive, and I was, uh, I, I just, I had to work really hard, and I was the most fired up one out there. I, I you know, if you were on my team, you got your hand on my, uh, my hand on your bum probably at least a hundred times during uh, your college career, and I made all the mistakes, and that's the big thing today is, you know, I'm telling you guys this stuff by experience. I, was the king of distance running. I was the king of plyometrics, and I had no strength base. I added a ton of strength to dysfunction by doing things like heavy back squats. Uh, it's just, I was intense. And really, not much has changed. I've just gotten smarter. Um, so here's, here's kind of the big thing that set me off on this, is I destroyed my Achilles tendon. I don't know, how many of you guys watch Seinfeld? Have you guys ever seen that episode where Kramer goes to the dentist and he's got, uh, he gets Novocaine so he can't talk and he comes out and he's wearing these things called the strength shoes and he's trying to catch a cab and he's walking around and he's like blah blah and they, they all think that he's mentally challenged because he's wearing these crazy shoes and uh, I was, those shoes take your heel and put them up and it puts your Achilles tendon on a ton of stretch, and it's supposed to make you more explosive. So, of course, I bought these shoes. This was actually in high school, trained for basketball. I bought these shoes, and I'm like, well, if, if a little bit of this is good, then I should probably run around the block in them, and I should probably run miles. And I just took those shoes and did a lot of silly stuff with them, not knowing what I was doing to myself. Um, I was doing a ton of machine training, uh, bodybuilding influence training. Uh, <clears throat> grind, grind, grind. That was, that's what I thought I had to do to be better at Ultimate. So, it, 
it, it all came down to one morning when it was, it was six in the morning. My big thing was I would do six miles on the incline treadmill. And my workout was like this. I would straddle the treadmill, <laughs> and then I would sprint for 30 seconds and then straddle. Sprint for 30 seconds. I'd do that all the way up for, to five miles. And, of course, you know, being all intense, I'm like, you know, 5% incline, t six, seven. I'd get all the way up to 10% incline. So it's just as intense as you can. It was one morning. Six in the morning, there's this hottie on the elliptical behind me, and I think I got the new Red Hot Chili Pepper CD, so I was, like, really feeling this, uh, to, to go from five miles to six miles, and I was, I was going hard, and I was just so motivated by that girl behind me, and, and I think it was re uh, Wet Sand by Red Hot Chili Peppers, and I was sprinting, 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 then boom, my Achilles, I, I fell off the treadmill, I just heard, I heard a snap of my Achilles, I didn't know what happened. Now, I didn't rip, I didn't detach my Achilles tendon from the calcaneus. I just, just tore a couple fibers, and I had to train, or I had to play the rest of my senior season with a really junky Achilles. I had to, uh, uh, I had to tape it, and it was just, it was bad news. So this is the point that I'm like, what? I just hurt myself by training so hard. Maybe I don't have a clue, and I didn't. I had, if at that point I started to look at my training, and I was like, man, I do. Uh, like, there's got to be a better way to train for ultimate because we don't need to be hurt. The, the, my senior season was not what it could have been because I was a doofus, okay? So I start looking online, and this is the time that I was captain of Buzz Ultimate. I'm like, okay, I'm going to train these guys. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to have the biggest season that we can. Start looking online, training for ultimate, training for ultimate. Nothing. There's no info on how to train for ultimate. So I'm like, all right, I'll do it myself. I was an exercise science major. I, just, I was injured. I was like, I'm just going to make this happen. I'm going to study this stuff. I'm going to train my team. So my thought was, stand on the shoulders of giants. If there's somebody uh, that's really good at something and you want to be, be good at it like them, go learn from them. So I went to the head strength and conditioning coach at Salisbury University. His name is Matt Nine. His name is Matt Nine. And he was incredibly empowering. It's, he is just one of, one of the biggest influences in my life. And it's funny because I was just, you know, I was a hippie kid. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I just wanted to move and swim and surf and paddle and have fun, play ultimate chase plastic. That's, that's who I was. I was an exercise science major, but I had no idea that strength and conditioning exists as a, uh, as a career. So once I met Matt and he's like, yeah, this is what I do for, this is what I do for a job. I, you know, I get paid to teach classes and train all these athletes. He's like, you could do it too. I'm like, no, no way. Like you could do this for a career. What? It, it just, it just made so much sense. So I took a class with him. I started developing strength and conditioning programs for my team, for Buzz Ultimate. I got Buzz Ultimate in the weight room. I, uh, and I did an internship with him. I started training field hockey, baseball, and soccer. And then I was all in. I'm like, all right, let's do this. It was, it, when, I, when I found out that I could do this for the rest of my life and actually get paid for it, I'm like, I'm going to be a strength and conditioning coach. It's just no-brainer. So I went and got a couple certifications. Only one that really matters, CSCS. If any of you guys are interested in becoming a strength and conditioning coach, that's what matters. I was all in. All right, so by a simple twist of fate, I ended up going to the University of Northern Iowa. Kind of crazy. If you guys know me, I'm really driven by mountains and ocean, and there's none of that. In, in Iowa, but I went under there to study under a guy named Jed Smith, who's just the best strength and conditioning coach I've ever known. Uh, <laughs> what paid for my school was to coach varsity athletes as Division One school, so I had, I made sure I got soccer, because I'm very passionate about speed and agility, swimmers, divers, football, I had the sprinters and jumpers in track, I just was completely thrown into, hey, train these athletes, earn your keep. What also paid for my school was I got to teach what at first was three classes, and these classes had never been taught before, so I had to develop the curriculum for these classes. Bodybuilding and sculpting, heavy resistance training, and total body conditioning. That's where I fell in love with curriculum development, because they're like, hey, Timmy, you got these classes, you're going to teach them to 30 undergraduate students, you're going to try to fill these classes, so you got to be good. Uh, go ahead, you know, write up what you would teach for bodybuilding and sculpting. They gave me complete freedom. To, to teach this, and, and I have these curriculums for these classes. So my first two semesters there, those are the classes that I taught. And then, you know, I, I, I went to the dean one day, and I was like, listen, you know, I'm crushing these classes, and people are signing up, people are, are wanting to, you know, on a wait list to get in them. I know that if you give me an ultimate class, I will fill it. And I said that to him probably three times. 
And then one day I went up to him. I knew I only had two semesters to go. I'm like, listen, Dr. Edgington, I will fill this class. It will be good for you. He looks at me and says, Timmy, nobody's going to come to a class where, where you teach them how to throw discs at holes. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's disc golf. I'm talking about ultimate. So, so, so I, pulled a, uh, I pulled a video up, and he's like, oh, that's cool. Like, well, why didn't you tell me? I was like, oh, well. This guy's kind of old, too, so he, he had no clue. So this was me at the University of Northern Iowa. This is Panther Ultimate class, first year, or first semester, second semester. I, I packed the class. It, it, was, it was super fun. And me being a, uh, the, the strength coach for track and field, of course, I, you know, I got the high jumpers, and I got all the best guys. I'm like, you got to come. You got to play Ultimate. And it was super cool to see, like, the, the six foot eight high jumpers come out there and sky for the disc at this big Division I university. So ammunition, I played my last year in ammunition, and I just invested a ton in this team. And if you guys see, ammunition has just been on the up and up and up. I'm so proud of those guys. Those guys, when I got there, they were, uh, it, was, it was pretty bad. And uh, they, they've really uh, increased due to, due to these guys. One summer when I was uh, at Iowa, I decided to hop in the Jeep, go, go Jeep in. Uh, out to Colorado to climb up some hills and do some 14er stuff. And at the same time, I went to learn from this guy. This is Boyd Epley. This is the founder of the National Strength and Conditioning Association. If you guys know anything about strength and conditioning, he is the godfather. They call him the godfather of strength and conditioning. He was the first ever paid strength coach at Nebraska, 1968. And he founded this uh, association. And he became my mentor for a summer. I learned everything I could at the, uh, the, the world headquarters of the National Strength and Conditioning Association. And what, what was super cool is last year we did a presentation at the U.S. Open. This is Boyd presenting opening for me. So it was, it was, it was a dream come true to, to get uh, kind of a uh, full circle there. So after, uh, after I finished up grad school, I moved down to Florida to write a book. And I'm still working on the book. It's actually out March 18th. We'll talk about that uh, later. And I started training. I started uh, really implementing everything to people one-on-one. -on -one. So I started training Kibo and Rook, who played uh, Jukebox Hero, and, and Rook's now playing with Brody on the, uh, on the wildfire. That's where uh, Tessa, my, my family lives. That's my dog, Tessa. She likes, to, she likes to play the Frisbee. Is she cute or what? Yeah. Brody, did you meet Tessa? You were at my crib. You didn't meet her? She must have been, like, in a bad mood or something. So... Here, so what happened with Kibo and Rook was pretty cool, because these guys were just all in. They were like, dude, I'm going to listen to whatever you say. Train me. So I was like, all right, let's do this. I'm going to do pre-testing. I'm going to do post-testing. I'm going to train you for eight weeks, see what happens. The results were just incredible. I mean, these guys, their, their 40s went from above 5 to below 5. Their serpentines went from above 9 seconds to below 9 seconds. Their, their, their pre-testing 300 shuttle was above 60 seconds. We got below 60 seconds. And the biggest thing was the vertical jumps went up, it was ridiculous how much the vertical jumps went up. So, uh, and I wasn't doing anything crazy. These guys were just untrained athletes, like most of the, the people that play ultimate. So, uh, so Kibo and Rook were, are really good friends with this guy named Goose. And you guys know Goose, because um, he is probably the most explosive ultimate player uh, in, in the ADL this year. And he, he was a leech. He used to call me and say, man, you know, I got to learn what, what you're teaching these guys. And Goose and I have developed a tremendous relationship, and I've kind of distance coached him, and we get together when we can to, uh, to do that. So I, I, I tell you about Goose because you guys are going to see a lot of him. He's one of my biggest supporters. He implements all this stuff, and he's a, just a good dude. He's going to have a big year this year. He does a lot for the sport, so make sure you – So that same, uh, that same semester – Brody was in town, and we got together. I remember the night Brody called me up. He's like, dude, we should, uh, we should hang out, and, uh, and you should come work with, work, work with the Gators. So we did a clinic, and, and we start, I started hanging out with Brody. And it was, it's funny because this is early 2011, and it was right when Brody made his YouTube. And I remember sitting in Starbucks, hanging out in Yuli, Florida with Brody, and uh, he's like, dude, like, you, you know you can do annotations? I'm like, annotations? What's that? He's like, you can put subscribe, and when people click on it, They'll subscribe to your channel. I'm like, no way. So, and then he just took that, and, and, and now he's, he's got a couple followers, I think, on YouTube. I don't, I don't have quite as many followers, but uh, it's just kind of funny that, that that's the beginning. And, you know, uh, Brody and I have, have maintained a good friendship all the way through. So I studied under some really good strength and conditioning coaches, but 
uh, something was missing. I, you know, I, I did a lot of Olympic lifting, a lot of power lifting, a lot of bilateral movements, and uh, I started, it, it just didn't work for me because my body's so asymmetrical, and I noticed that ultimate players need something else. So I needed one more mentor. So I moved to Boston, and I started with this guy named Michael Boyle. And Mike is just, he's hands down the most influential strength coach in the world. He's, uh, he, he's absolutely incredible. And what he did, or what he's done, is really merged rehab and training, because it's really the same thing. And super progressive thinker, uh, I came up and worked in the North Andover facility and the Woburn facility once uh, during the summer of 2011. And then in the summer, uh, Mike and Bob, Bob's the, the co-owner of, uh, of MBSC, uh, they're like, Timmy, we're opening a facility in Haverhill, and you've done a nice job with us this summer. Uh, would you like to take some responsibility in Haverhill and, and hang out and work for MBSC? And I'm like, absolutely. So, uh, so that's where I've been. I've been the past uh, couple years, that's the, that's the Haverhill facility. That's the Woburn facility in 2010. That was the men's health number one gym in America. That's the whole crew during Thanksgiving. Uh, and, and that's where I've been training. Or that's been my kind of weight room. Uh, sits in. So you guys can see all this information that I'm going to give you is, is really, i got to credit my mentors. These are my mentors. They helped me get to where I am. A lot of this information comes from them and from trial and error and uh, just doing what I do. So all the while, I'm developing this. I'm hustling. Everything I learn, I'm like, how can I apply this to ultimate players? So I, moral performance. Did 40-plus clinics, traveling all over the world. Uh, just developing my brand, which you guys know is Moral Performance. There's just a couple clinic photos. There's Dominican Republic. There's Ken Porter. There's the Chicago Clinics, Truck Stop. There's a New York Clinic. There's Taylor, Taylor Pope, Michael Caldwell. There's one of the National Championship women's players from last year. And here's what's cool. Let me regress. 2008, I went down to Nationals to, uh, to just fish and just, just be a kid out there taking pictures and uh, that was when I decided that Boston Ironside was my favorite team. I was actually born up here. My, uh, <clears throat> I, I was born in Boston. I was always a Celtics fan, and I just love the style of the Ironside. So I actually took this picture. I took a, a ton of cool pictures that year, 2008, and uh, that's, that's Paul catching the game winner. I think it gets Chain to go on to the finals uh, against Jam that year, 2008. We lost to Jam. And... Through, one thing led another, I ended up training my favorite team. Now I, I'm the strength coach for Ironside. And, I mean, what an awesome dream come true for me to, to let that kind of come full circle. So what we did, and i got to credit Christy Kim and George Stubbs because they are the playmakers who made this happen. In order for me to be able to go from Haverhill to, uh, to Harvard to train these guys, we teamed up. We got Brute Squad and Ironside. You put those together, and you've got the Iron Squad. And this is really where my heart is. I think I obsess about how to make these guys better more than, I, more than anything that I do. They have my full heart. And, uh, and this, is, this is just some pictures. This is, uh, this is us doing what we do, some of the iron squads. There's, we, we brought out a professional photographer this year, and I had to show some of her pictures because uh, Gretchen, she's, uh, she's down in Cambridge, I think. And uh, Christy's super photogenic. There's... Some turf sessions. We train out of Harvard. Uh, Harvard turf. Is George looking, looking good? There's, is that the cricket? That's the cricket. Um, if you guys don't know the cricket, you guys, you guys want to know the cricket? Um, raise your hand if you know the cricket. Crickshots.com. <laughs> so hashtag Iron Squad. So I went down to nationals just to keep these, guy healthy, these guys healthy in 2012. And uh, we rode down to Sarasota. Uh, we didn't actually row down to Sarasota. That would have been ridiculous. We would have had to go. We would have been tired or go around the Gulf of Mexico. And, but these are the best hashtags of 2012. Uh, I, Ironside did really good with hashtags this year. I was proud of them. And uh, Brody, come on, man. I wasn't real happy with Brody. It was a windy tournament. That's, uh, that's how it turned out. It's me in the red hat. That, uh, yeah. All right, so 2013, this is where I am. This is, uh, I, I've, kinda, I've gone through this. I've coached a lot, and I've started to pull back from training every single team. You know, like last year, Seattle Sockeye, Seattle Riot, hey, come train us. Absolutely, I'm, I'm there. This year, not so much. I know I'm to the point that I want to give to these teams that I, that the hungry, the hungriest teams. And I'm telling you, these are the hungriest teams in Ultimate. 
This is just a sneak peek at our Inside Yearly Plan. We'll, uh, we'll get more into that another time. So, Moral Performance is my one brand. My second brand is called Explosive Ultimate. And I just, I created this because I, I, like to, I like to ride surfboards, I like to paddle, I'm a competitive beach patrol lifeguard, I like to train swimmers, football players. I train, moral performance has to be more general, okay? I created Explosive Ultimate uh, in order to develop coaches to take this curriculum that I've created that we'll, that we'll talk about 115 and go teach it to the world because there's a lot of stuff that we got to clean up when it comes to training for Ultimate. And it's just, it's so important right now. If we want to grow our sport, if we want to be on ESPN, the plays that make ESPN are the big explosive plays, okay? We need to train as explosive athletes, and we need to be smart about what we do. So Explosive Ultimate uh, just started it about a year ago, and you guys are going to be seeing a lot, a lot more of it, uh, developing coaches. These are our coaches for 2013. Um, Patrick Kelsey is doing a great job. Jared's up in Maine. Josh Marquette is the cricket, is his alias, and he's, uh, he coaches with us. And then Jill Zeller, this is Josh down in... Uh, uh, Paideia High School, there's Jared coaching at Smith College, there's us doing a combine, and there's my boy B. Dean. All right, you guys, uh, you guys ready to jam on this? You guys ready to get into the, to the content? Now that you guys know uh, who I am and, and why we're doing it, thanks for, uh, thanks for going through that. I think that was important to kind of draw some context. So that's Jerry, if you don't know, he's one of the biggest influences in my life. All right, so we got to talk about what we are and what we are not. <laughs> We, we're ultimate players. All the, the majority of the movements that we do in a field is going to be off of one leg, okay? We are field sport athletes, and we're incredibly asymmetrical. We step out with one leg. We pivot with one leg. We rotate from one side. We, we've got to be strong. We've got to be powerful. We've got to be fast. We've got to have finesse. We are not bodybuilders, okay? We are not crossfitters. We are not powerlifters. These are the things that we are not, we are not yogis, we are not distance runners. So many people in Ultimate take these things, fall in love with them, and that's their, all they do is train for that, and then they think that it's going to make them a better Ultimate player. What we need to do is take all these things, take little pieces from them, and insert it into a sensible program for training for Ultimate. So... Here's what I want to do. I want to blast that. I just want to kind of burn these down. These are very quick misconceptions, and then we're going to dive in to eight very popular training for ultimate misconceptions. So I'm going to blast through this, and again, at the end, if you guys want to come back to these, no problem. So for the ladies in here, I only see a couple of them. Lifting's going to make me jacked. Timmy, I don't want to turn into Shira. Get me the 2.5-pound dumbbell because the eight is too heavy. Listen. It's, an, it's a hormone thing. Women are not going to be big. I have trained a ton of athletes, and I've never turned one of them into Shira. Okay? Ladies, go with the big girl dumbbells. Okay? You've got to get strong. Second misconception, I can't get strong in season. That's completely false. People should be lifting all the way through to a couple days before nationals, and you can continue putting weight on the bar. You can get stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. It is absolutely no problem. Ladder drills are the key to agility. The ladder's a great tool, but we're not out here training for the Lord of the Dance, okay? We're not Michael Flatley doing all this twinkle toe stuff. People think, hey, I bought an agility ladder, I'm going to do some ladder drills, and then I'm going to be a better ultimate player. We need to be smarter about what we use the ladder. Caffeine is bad for you. <laughs> we, uh, we, we should drink... Caffeine is an ergogenic aid, okay? We just need to be smart about what we do with it. Ex black espresso, this is four shots of espresso over ice. We need to time the use, okay? So it's not, I mean, that's only like 200 milligrams of caffeine. Uh, we, we need to time the use for it. So Red Bull, all that stuff is out, but people say, oh, Red Bull is bad, therefore caffeine must be bad. No, caffeine is great. Uh, we just need to time the use. Uh, the only way to do conditioning is through running. So many people say, hey, I need to be fit, so I'm going to go run. Running is pretty high impact, okay? There's, there's a lot of uh, other stuff that we could do to lower the impact. For example, number one conditioning tool in my mind is the aerodyne, okay? Because we get upper body, lower body, your heart rate. You get your heart rate higher on an aerodyne than anything. I believe everybody should, if you can, go on Craigslist, get an aerodyne, put it in your living room, use it all the time. We could also use slide boards and elliptical. When it comes to conditioning, people say, hey, should I jump on the, the stationary bike? 
I, I would stay away from the stationary bike. You're not going to get your heart rate up very high with a stationary bike because it's only lower body. We, we've got to do stuff that involves upper body too. So the elliptical uh, and the aerodynes are, are a good thing. Uh, and then distance running to increase your cardio. This, this is not, an, an, it's, it's really moving away from being an endurance sport, especially with the MLU and AUDL. So I see no reason to ever run over two miles. Really, I see no reason to ever run over uh, 200 meters. Yes, sir. And Aerodyne is a bike, it's a fan bike that you just, you, you use the pedals and you, you get it going. So, yeah, yeah. So it allows you to get your heart rate up super high. And anything, uh, anything here, you guys can email me, I'll send you the links. Um, all right, so let's get into static stretching. Reb's looking good here, huh? He's, uh, he's got a big smile on his face. There's some iron squats. Stretching. All right, so, dude, you're static stretching before exercise, that's bad. You're going to decrease your power, bro. How many of you guys have heard that? Uh, all right, so that's not, that's not the case. It's, it's kind of funny because I think that we should, we should go into this. This article was published in 2009. I actually remember when it was published because I was interning for Matt Nine, and he was like, whoa, we've got to stop static stretching. I'm like, what? So this was the paper that caused this big outlast that said we've got to stop static stretching. And thanks to Chris Wykus, who's a strength coach, who's Johnny Bravo's strength coach. You can check him out on the a vlogcast that I do. Explosive Ultimate Vlogcast, he's on episode five and six. So the big thing here is they did 15 minutes of static stretching. And then they did it in one group. And the other group did a dynamic warm up. And then they immediately tested vertical jumps and 20 meter sprints, okay? Guess which group decreased, guess which group had a higher power output? The dynamic warm up group, right? It's obvious, if we stretch for 15 minutes, if we take our tissue to end range, it's not gonna produce as much power. Absolutely, that's, inc that's absolutely true. But if, if you read the practical applications here, which people must have skimmed over, if static stretch is included in place of or in addition to a dynamic warm-up routine, it should be followed by a period of modest to high-intensity sports-specific activity that includes some form of skill rehearsal. Okay, here's the thing that we need to do. We need a static stretch and then do a dynamic warm-up, and that dynamic warm-up will include some form of skill rehearsal, meaning we do our skips, we do our, our lateral skips, we do everything that we're going to see in sport, which is what we're going to get into at 115 as far as how we structure warm-ups. But my hypothesis is this. I honestly believe that static stretching improves power output, and that's because when we static stretch prior to our dynamic warm-ups, we're going to be in better positions for the rest of the workout because we've linked to that tissue, we've gotten to know our hips, we've opened up our hips, and if I'm in a better position, then I'm going to generate more power, okay? The static stretching will come at the very beginning of the workout, then dynamic warm-up, and then we're going to do our power exercise. Usually that's about 15 minutes that's passed before we're doing any kind of explosive movement and static stretching. So. Really, the thing that we under, have to understand is this. Perfect world, we're going to do self-myofast release, static stretching, dynamic warm-up. How does that work? Self-myofast release, we're going to decrease the density of the tissue. We're going to rub out the bumps. Then we're going to go into static stretching. We're going to lengthen the tissue. We're going to be much more supple. We're going to be in much better positions. And then we're going to go into dynamic warm-up. So iron squad stretches. Every single session, no exceptions. I work at a facility, MBSC, the one in Woburn, 300 athletes a day. Every single athlete stretch, static stretches. Nobody has any problems. So what's the solution? We've got to adopt this four-way hip model. This is a super easy just thing to say, hey, I'm going to stretch today. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to stretch front side, back side, inside, outside. I'm going to open up my hips. And it's sweet if, if you think about it. It, it really makes you get to know your hips, and there's a million ways to skin a cat. There's a number of ways to stretch front side, back side, inside, outside. Here's a front side stretch with muscle wallach. There's a back side stretch with iron squad. There's an inside, an adductor groin stretch with Kibo and me, and there was actually Brody yesterday doing a posterior capsule stretch, uh, or what, what did you name it, Brody? You, you're calling it, he named that stretch the femur pop. Is, uh, the new name for it, or outside something like a pigeon pose in yoga. So, you know, and I'm really, I'm still not convinced that we shouldn't just static stretch and then go play ultimate. I mean, when I was, when I was down at uh, Nationals this year, we did a ton of this band distraction, very intense static stretching right before they would play, and nobody had a problem. 
okay? This is me and uh, Kelly Starrett, and that's some real intense static stretching, and I got in a better position. I could squat better after that, and I was doing some explosive movements right after that. I static stretch to end range all the time and then go do power movements. I think that people overreact to stuff, and I think the lesson here is that just when, you, when you're looking for information like this, you know, Listen to the people that actually train athletes. You know, that, that study came from people in a, in a laboratory. And uh, we, we just, you know, we, we've got to be... We've got to be smart about this stuff. And it, and it really, just try it. It will work. Disclaimer, every athlete is different, okay? If you're just not... If for some reason static stretching just affects you uh, poorly, then, then that's just... Uh, just don't static stretch. That's, you, gotta, you got to know your body. Okay, so here's the next piece, flows right in. Yoga, people, <laughs> people in the off-season are, are, are tight, so they think what's going to make me untight is I'm going to go to yoga, okay? Uh, raise your hand if you've done a lot of yoga. Not, many, not too many yogis in here, some of us? Okay, good. So is, is yoga going to make you a better ultimate player? Here's a, somebody actually just sent me this on Twitter the other day. Here's kind of the argument for yoga. It's going to improve strength, balance, flexibility, mental control. And this guy happened to meet his wife in yoga, so he's really, <laughs> he's really into yoga. Uh, so here's, here's what we can do to be smarter. We can integrate little principles of this into our program. Because the thing about yoga is you're just saying, all right, I'm not going to stretch specific things. I'm just going to go in there, and I'm going to stretch everything and hope that, it, hope that I'm stretching the right things. Okay, we need to stretch in direct ways. Not, not everybody needs to stretch their hamstring. Not everybody needs to stretch their hip flexor. We have to have a prescription for our business, what's tight on us, and that's what we need to stretch. So here's the things that we can take from yoga. You know, if you look at an SLDL, this, that's a, that's a warrior three pose. An inchworm, you guys do the inchworms and downward, uh, or, uh, in warm-ups all the time, that's just a kind of flowing that upward, downward dog thing. Uh, the pigeon pose is just a posterior capsule stretch. Um, good thing from yoga, we've got to learn how to breathe. And this is pretty advanced, but I've got all my athletes blowing up balloons and blowing through straws in order to teach them how to use their deep pelvic floor muscles and their diaphragm, and that's going to make, uh, th that's a game changer. If you can, if you can start learning the, the dead bugs and the planks with the balloons, that's going to be huge. Um, and yoga is awesome for presence as well. Practicing presence is a great thing. For me, what I prefer, rather than just doing stretching, I, I know what's tight on my body. I know what I need to stretch. So I put on a little bit of two-bob crew, and I just have a little zen flow session. Light a candle, hang out, and, uh, and stretch. And, and that's, that's going to be uh, you know, a superior thing than having somebody kind of coach you through this stuff. And the big thing is lifting is going to make you more flexible. When you load, a, when you load tissue eccentrically, it, it holds that. And, and you're going to want uh, to think about that. So here's just a couple. There's Hirsch and Teddy, <laughs> PVJ. Uh, and there's me doing a, uh, an SLDL on, at a swamp. And uh, there's, there's George. And uh, that's just that. I mean, it looks just like an upward dog in yoga. So here's another thing that yoga does that, that I don't, I don't think is real good, is we want to avoid this position. This is overextension of the spine, okay? And yoga is just get, extend, extend, spend all this time in that position. It's really, it's not healthy, and it's not going to increase our power output. You know, this is picking on Brody a little bit. I know he's going for a high D there, but that's a very curved position. We don't want to see curves like that in, in games. We want to see straight lines as much as possible. That's Mikey Lund work on acceleration mechanics. So spending a lot of time there, like they try to get you to do in yoga, it's not a good idea. Um, if you are going to do yoga, Bikram yoga is, you know, I'll tell you, I did a lot of Bikram yoga. And I, uh, I mean, I was so into it. I was completely sold. I was like, if one time a day is good, I'm going to do two times a day. And uh, <laughs> if you're going to do yoga, do Power Yoga, Baron Baptiste, he's a stud. That's a very athletic form of yoga. This, to me, only this can actually kind of hurt you. There's crazy excessive hamstring stretches and stuff that uh, I just think people don't need with Bikram. Um, all right, so here we go, number six. How are we doing? All right, we're doing all right. So bodybuilder splits. 
right, so when we go to the grocery store, it, there's going to be all these fitness magazines. That's where our influences come from. Like, it was only, what, like 30 years ago that Arnold started saying, hey, man, we got we to gotta lift weights, and, and we start doing this stuff. So, so much of our programming, so much of our influence as athletes comes from men's fitness and all this stuff that is for aesthetic. A, a, aesthetic. How do you say that word? Aesthetics? Aesthetics. Okay, so... That's me being big into whatever word I just said. And you can see I, that summer I was really into chest separation. I wanted to see how much separation I get in my chest. And I was doing all this crazy stuff. Was I performing well? No, because I was training like a bodybuilder. It's, it's not about looking good. Looking good does not transfer to performance. So some of the biggest things that, uh, that we see and we have to realize is that these are not good exercises. Like never, never do a crunch. Uh, curls are, are, are not a functional exercise, shrugs are not a functional exercise, upright rows, cable crossovers, and anything on a machine. Machines are not meant for athletes, okay? Bicep curls are acceptable during the summer months, right, Tina? Bicep curls June through, June through September. Deal? You guys cool with that? You can bicep curls in September? All right. So here's the problem with, uh, with machines. Is it, is a, it's a fixed range of motion, right? So you guys have seen that Smith machine. You go to the gym, it's, kinda, it's attached to something. Any of these machines, we'll do a Smith machine overhead press, for example. The shoulder is meant to travel through its natural range of motion, okay? It, wants, it doesn't want to travel through this fixed range of motion that a machine tells you to travel through, especially because we're throwing athletes. I mean, this shoulder is probably going to be more mobile than this shoulder. So when you get into a machine, it's cementing in this default pattern that isn't even your natural shoulder pattern, okay? That is, it's not a good thing. It compromises the joint. Uh, also, your feet aren't in contact with the ground, so that's just completely non-functional. We need to have our feet in contact with the ground on most uh, strength exercises. So just, I get, I get emails, hey, Timmy, what should I be doing? I, I've been doing leg press for, uh, for this, and just please, no, uh, no more of that. No more of those emails. So the smarter idea is to do stuff like this, to do split squats, rear foot elevated split squats, one leg squats, skater squats, goblet squats, use free weights, dumbbells, kettlebells, okay? More dumbbells and kettlebells than barbells. <clears throat> Here's what a typical bodybuilder split day looks like. They're saying, hey, we're going to do a legs day, then a chest day, and then the next day we're going to do a back abs and, and caps day. This is not the, the way that we want to program for, for our training week. Here's, here's a better idea. So if we're training two to three days a week, there's no reason that we can't just do everything. So here's how we separate um, what we do. We're gonna, we've got to do explosive hip extension. We've got to do something hip, hip dominant. We've got to do something knee dominant. We've got to push. We've got to pull. We've got to do something for our core. And we got to do some kind of little plyo uh, prep exercise, meaning some kind of jump and stick type thing. So you guys will see, this is Christian Foster, an Ironside player. This is his phase two. Been doing a lot of uh, distance programming for, for these guys since I look so far away. So the A1 is a hang power clean, which is explosive hip extension. He hasn't cleaned before, so he's doing hang power cleans both days. This is day one, this is day two. And then we've got a hip extension exercise, a core exercise, a knee dominant exercise, a pressing exercise, a core exercise, a hip dominant exercise, a hip dominant exercise, and a little push-pull circuit. Same thing other day. We're hitting everything both days. Because the thing about bodybuilding is you're pushing everything till failure. Okay, that's why they need to do a chest day one day a week because they're going to rep and rep and rep and rep until they're completely burnt out. And that's, uh, that's good if you want to get big. But us as athletes, every session we need to do that. Now, some of you may ask, well, what happens if I train four times a week? We could still, we should separate it this way. So we do explosive hip extension both days. We do a push, and we do a pull. I mean, we, we do a push day, push and knee dom core, pull hip dom core. So that's, uh, that's how we would structure a four-day-a-week program. All right, misconception number five is stair workouts and track workouts. Um, and I know I'm flying here going fast, but uh, a lot of this information is we're going to slow it down and break it down in, in the 115 presentation where we do the explosive ultimate curriculum. Um, so stair workouts, track workouts. Here's the thing about stairs is when you run up stairs, generally you're probably only going this high. And you're, the next step comes be generally before you get into full hip extension. 
This is where speed is. This is hip extension. Hip extension. This is how we run faster, jump higher, is to get into this full position. You can see my butt. It's not on right now. Not on right now. Now it's on. That last piece is where speed is, is being able to activate the glute in hip extension. You don't do that in stair running. It's just knee flexion, knee flexion, knee flexion, repeated cycles of knee flexion, and you're just you're adding conditioning on top of a bad pattern, okay? And if you read this book, it's called Sports Speed by Dentman and Ward. These, these guys are just a track and field gurus. What they recommend for starting an acceleration is one to three degrees and no more than eight degrees. Look at this. That's, ten That's not very steep, okay? A, a big hill or stairs are going to be more like 40 degrees. Okay, so, so it's just these guys have trained track athletes for years and years and years. I'm going to listen to them. I'm gonna, when I'm going to train acceleration, I'm going to train a very short angle, and I'm going to think about stuff. <clears throat> I'm going to think about stuff like hip extension. So really, top end speed for track is, is what we do with track workouts. That is rare in ultimate, okay? Uh, I, re I really think we don't run in a straight line more than 30 yards. It's, it's very rare, okay? And the exception would be receivers. We're, we're, you know, going into this new era of ultimate, this new breed of athlete, I'm going to start training receivers different than I'm training handlers, okay? I'm going to train Colin Mahoney different than I'm going to train uh, Reb because I know Reb's going to be back there with the disc, and I know Colin's going to be waiting to, to shoot deep. But when he shoots deep, he's probably not going to go more than 40 yards at once, um, so, you know, that's, that's a time that we might train something linear for that long. But just running around a track, it's, you know, people are setting their ways. It tends to be uh, a pretty easy thing to do because it's super uh, quantifiable. It's very easy to quantify your, uh, you know, your track workout. So I think that's why, that's why people like it. So is it bad? No. But is there better stuff that we can do for conditioning, for speed development? Absolutely. So if we're going to be smarter... Here's what we can do. If we're going to be, if we want to develop speed, we want to prioritize acceleration. Okay? How do we prioritize acceleration? We do stuff like resistance running. Look at cricket. There's a, 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 crick, a cricket spotting again. You can see his right leg is at uh, knee flexion, toe up, knee up, and his back leg's in full extension. Look at Betsy. Do you guys see that full extension piece? That's what we need to train over and over and over again. If we don't see that in our athletes when we're making when we're doing uh, speed work, then we're making a mistake. So resistant running, lean fall runs, hip extension, every different starting variation that you could think of, working on developing the glutes. Okay, that bum, ba bum, bum, bum is what it's all about. Who, who said that? Was that Cisco? Is that Cisco who said that, that quote, that, that bum? It really is. The glute should be the primary hip extensor. Okay, and so many times we make the hamstring the primary hip extensor, and that's bad news. So when it comes to conditioning, I'm getting rolling here. Let's, let's go. Why didn't I drink more of this earlier? All right, let's rock. All right, so conditioning, what can we do? 150 shuttles, changes of direction, uh, repeat interval sprint, aerodyne bikes, elliptical. We're going to dive deep into that in, uh, in the next presentation. So <laughs> that dude with the foam roller is a weirdo. Why does he carry that foam roller around with him at tournaments? <laughs> that's, that's Will Neff. You like that picture? I thought that was funny. Listen, the foam roller, self-myofascial release, let's define this word. Self means me, myofascial. Who knows what the prefix myo means? PK? Muscle. Man, you're smart. We should get, I should make, you should, we need to talk about explosive ultimate, me and you. Get you, get you coach. Um, so self Muscle and fascia release, right? Here's the deal. Tissue is going to get junky. It's going to get dense. It's going to get tight. It's going to get bound down. It's what happens when we add, uh, uh, when we play sports, okay? And, and it happens more with AIDS. Think about it as, as beef jerky versus filet mignon. Beef jerky, it's not going to be supple. It's going to be kind of just gritty and, and nasty and gnarly versus a nice, piece of filet mignon. And if you guys, uh, you know, I, I do some hands-on work uh, occasionally, or, or I'll just, when, with my friends, I'll kind of do some uh, some massage type stuff, and you can feel it. I mean, the massage therapist can feel it, absolutely. The pieces that are tight and junky and bound down versus the pieces that are nice and supple, we need to try to make more filet mignon in our body. So we're going to decrease the density via 
using all these tools. These are our allies in our fight against junky tissue. So what can we do? We can use a barbell. We could smash our quads with a barbell. We could smash whatever with, with a lax ball. My, one of my favorite tools is a, is a rumble roller. Uh, people can use water bottles, or you can just have a, have a super friend come in and say, hey, dig your elbow into my glute and, and kind of supple up that tissue for me. So these are all, to me, this is all essential stuff. Like in your, in your ultimate bag, you should have a little roller, and you should have a little, everybody should have a, a, a lax ball, and you should be doing this all the time. It doesn't matter how healthy you are. From, this is not just for uh, injured athletes. You can see Christy there working on, uh, a little thing, and that's between sessions of, uh, uh, of 150s. So how can we integrate this into the stuff that we do? Um, <clears throat> social time at the beginning of sessions. This is Haley and, and Dory at, a, at an Iron Squad session, and usually I just say, hey, here's all your lax balls. You guys have 10 minutes. Find your business. You know what your business is, meaning your tight spots. Like for me, I've got a very tight, right? Calf, that's my business. I need to handle my business, right? So before my uh, workout, I'm gonna smash that. I'm gonna smash that calf, so I'll be in a better position. So and it turns into a nice little social time. So it's kind of fun. High school coaches, people that uh, that want to do that, that, the kids enjoy it. And you're gonna see a lot of what we call the pain face, which uh, she shouldn't be making. Um, and then. I really like the idea of hotel smash parties, you know, evenings at, at, uh, at tournaments. What I mean by that is, hey, tonight, we're after we all get out of the shower, do whatever we're going to do, we're going to take our lax ball, we're going to set the timer for five minutes on this leg, and we're just going to smash whatever is tight, whether it's glutes, hamstrings, quads, everybody do some work for five minutes, boom, the timer goes off, boom, go to the other side. It's going to make you feel so much better, you're going to perform better the next day. Me, I just like to spend some time just... Like I said, a little Zen flow, put on a candle, put on some two bob crew, and roll around on my on my apartment floor, just <laughs> rolling out whatever's tight. Okay, that's that's a good thing to do. Um, and then you can pair it with stuff like if I want to get good at overhead pressing, I could you know I could decrease the density in my trap, so I'll be in better overhead positioning, so I can press more. Daniel Fish. It really depends because. Some people have such dense pieces that they may need to work on it for a really long time. Uh, you know, or I, I, it really just depends what's going on in your, uh, you know. That, that's for like a whole team, people who aren't really into this and just want to chase plastic, that's probably the bare minimum. People that want to perform and live up their athletic potential, you need to start knowing what you need and spend more time kind of uh, – you know, really thinking about, okay, I should probably spend five minutes on this glute because this is, this is where my business is. <clears throat> All right, misconception number three, and this is uh, one that really resonates with me because I did a lot of plyos, and I destroyed myself, or I destroyed my Achilles because of it, and I wasn't doing much, I wasn't doing any smart lifting with it, and I, we see this too much. People are like, plyos, man, that's sexy, that's the stuff where we're just running around jump in, that's what I need to do to become a better ultimate player. And people ended up, people ended up getting hurt, and it's, uh, it's not a good thing. So just we, we have to understand that plyometrics are anything that involves the stretch shortening cycle. So anything that involves a, a, an elastic response, meaning going from an eccentric contraction to a concentric contraction. And that's going to be um, very quick. We're putting force into the ground, but quick. So not a lot of force but as fast as we can, and the stronger we get, the more force we can put in the ground in that short amount of time, and that's where speed and jumping and everything really starts to play in. So we need to be, start, we need to be smart about our, our plyos, and the big thing is we've got to learn to stick. We've got to learn to absorb force and get back into our glutes. So many people, you ask them to do that, and it looks like this, and they're just sending stuff. We need to be able to jump and stick and absorb. You can see what happens is I absorb with my soleus, my gastroc, and then I bypass the knee, and then I get into my glute. That's huge, okay? Learn to stick, learn to stick, learn to stick, whether it's performance training or rehab. I just had Brody doing that yesterday. Just, hey, you got a bum knee. You need to learn how to absorb that force, how to bypass the knee and go into your glute. Um, and then we can start to add something, uh, an elastic response, so a quick pop, pop, a double response, and then eventually a quick on and off the ground. Um, here's the deal with depth jumps. That's the definitely like what everybody wants to do is, is depth jumps. Very, 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 very advanced. 
Goose has asked me if he can do depth jumps for the past two years. No, 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 no. Yes, he could, he could do depth jumps this year because he deadlifted 455 pounds and he are rear foot elevated split squat 225 by five. He's strong enough to handle depth jumps. Most people are not strong enough to handle depth jumps. So, you know, that, that <laughs> me in, in college, I, I was like, man, that's what the cool kids are doing is depth jumps, so I gotta do that. And I just had no business doing them. Um, <clears throat> All right, number two. So you need a physical therapist to help you rehab. I, I think that this is, uh, this is huge. Uh, I, I, I just think that people need to be smarter about getting back onto the field and not just going to one physical therapist and listening to everything they say and seeing them twice a week. And we, we can do a better job of rehab and being proactive. Okay, so first we have to understand a, a chiropractor is somebody who does high velocity manipulations, like the, the back cracks, that sort of stuff. A physical therapist just is kind of a jack of all trades rehab specialist, but physical therapists tend to be a little bit, uh, there's a ton of great physical therapists, don't get me wrong, but a lot of them, it's a billable thing through insurance, they've got a half hour. They're, they've got all kinds of clients coming in. They're going to throw you on stuff like the ultrasound and just these, these modalities that really aren't going to make you better and keep you coming back so their you know, PT company can make, make money. And, uh, and then there's a licensed massage therapist who's probably uh, one, of the, one of the best things that you could do. So the idea is that all humans, this is a quote from Kelly Starr, all humans should be able to perform basic maintenance on themselves. Okay, there's a lot of times that we waste so much time going to physical therapists trying to get better when if we just uh, would perform the basic maintenance on ourselves, we'd be fine. Like, like Brody, like he's got a bum knee, and so he came to me, he's like, Timmy, my knee hurts, what can I do? He was proactive, and now he's going to be back on the field much sooner because I taught him what he needs to know to be able to perform this basic maintenance on himself, okay? Your physical therapist, be critical of them. See multiple People get multiple opinions, and my thing, this new era of strength coach is pretty cool. This is my guy, Brendan Rierick. He does nothing but go to course, course after course, taught by physical therapists, taught by chiropractors, um, it, but he's a strength coach, and he's allowed to put his hands on athletes now because he's also a licensed massage therapist, which is just a year certification. So look for, if you want to get better, my, I, I say look for an LMT, somebody who's PRI certified, somebody who's FMS certified. Those are the big things. Brennan Rear, Kevin Carr, and Woburn are, uh, are, are complete mega studs. And then my guy, Tim Morgan, uh, is in Woburn, Woburn as well. Uh, and, and another big thing is these, these voodoo bands. So many people, when they're hurt, it's like, man, I sprained my ankle. I'm going to hang out for a week. I'm going to do nothing. I'm just going to hang out and rice, right? Rest, ice, compression, and elevation. Okay, that is, that's lazy. If we use voodoo bands, we could get better much faster. This is, uh, this is hers coming back from ECC, hanging out practice. He's like, dude, I sprained my ankle, uh, and it's, it's not going down. The inflammation's been the same for about two weeks, I mean, for about two days. And I'm like, well, dude, why didn't you tell me? So I took this voodoo band, which is just a compression band, and I wrapped above the joint, and I wrapped below the joint. And then I took it through full range of motion, and the idea is there's all that inflammation, there's all that fluid just hanging out, pulled up in there. Let's get that fluid out. And then when we take off the bands, all the fluid's going to rush back in. Healthy fluid, healing fluid. Daniel Fish. It's, it's called a, a voodoo band. It's available at roguefitness.com. And I absolutely believe that every single team should have these with them at a tournament. Because I bet you, Hurst was better the next day. He called me, he's like, no way. Like, the, the, this completely worked. And uh, so if, if he sprained his ankle doing something stupid on a Friday night at a tournament, then, you, you know, we could, we could get all that inflammation out of there. He might be ready to play on Sunday. So that's, uh, that's kind of a, a good way to kind of take care of ourselves. And as far as injuries go, um, it's, it's 1040. I could kind of blast through this. I, you can go till 11. So if anybody has to leave for the next presentations in five minutes, that's fine. But I'm probably going to go for another about 10 minutes here, and then we'll, we'll do some questions. Um, so the solutions to shoulders is 
You know, that's Alton, and that's kind of the mechanism behind shoulder injuries in Ultimate. Like, he's pancake catching the disc. He's probably going to land, and his humerus is going to drive back in the socket. He's probably going hurt to his, hurt his shoulder. That happens all the time, okay? So we need to train this, which is extension, okay? Not overextension, not that. Straight up extension as much as possible. So we catch the disc, we cue our hips to go through, and we get into this global extension position so that we can land in a good position. Extension, extension, extension. The more that we can lay out and get that full extension, the better. So I really like the slip and slide. I think that's a, that's a cool tool for, for learning. And we could take, uh, it's good for college recruiting too, is you know hanging out, everybody, all the college kids hanging out doing slip and slide layouts. I think the diving board is a good, uh, a good way to teach extension. But the biggest things are just cleans and snatches and all these explosive hip extension movements that we know works well. So, uh, it's, it's also, it's very possible, as far as shoulders go, to reach across, grab the disc, and then get back into this position and land eloquently. Uh, I saw George do that last, last year at practice. I was like, man, he's going to hurt himself because he was in the air in this position. And then it flying through the air, he goes like this and lands in that fully extended position, and, and it was a clean landing. So, actually, Chuck, Charlie Foxtrot Films, the guy on the camera, made some plays last night. Let's see if he's got, ah. Let's see if this plays. This is just a dumbbell snatch. And uh, what's cool about this movement, did you guys see the mouse? What's cool about this movement is nothing's cool about it because it's not going to play. Oh, here we go. Why is it not working? But it's a, it's a, it's a, what's we call it, fall? We'll come back to that. I'll show that in the next thing. That's just a snatch, which really teaches that, a dumbbell snatch teaches that overhead uh, position. Maybe I'll try to get, play that at the end. So if we have knees, what do we need to do? We need to learn how to stick. We need to do a ton of one leg uh, strength training variations. So tons of mini band work, tons of staggered positions. So getting back into that glute, getting that glute on stretch and loading the glute from that position. So staggered deadlifts, reach across SLDLs, doing stuff where we create a vertical tibia, meaning this not letting this knee track way in front of the toe, which normally would be great. It's, it's not a problem to do that. But if we've got knee pain, then we've, we've really got to strengthen the front of the quad. And keeping the vertical tibia is going to be um, going to be a good thing. So that's Reb. He had a bum knee last year. He's all better. There's Brody Smith 21. Uh, at the gym yesterday doing a, uh, uh, a skater squat. And that's actually, Brody and I made a really good video. If you guys are interested in knees, we did, uh, I gave him like four exercises that he's going to need uh, to heal his knee. Uh, and, and I put that up on the YouTube. Um. <clears throat> Junkie Achilles, we need to do eccentric heel drops. And uh, that's, pretty, that's pretty straightforward. We need to do kind of pogo style plyometric variations. Um, low back pain, we sit too much. If your back hurts, then, you know, if you think, if I sit here all day like this, then I'm just, you know, you've seen the panini machines. I'm just making a panini out of my butt. I'm just compression and heat. And that's going to turn my butt off. And if my butt's not working, my low back's going to do the work. And that's going to make my back hurt. Okay? So uh, we need to unglue our butt. We need to strengthen our butt. We need to stop sitting so much. And stuff like spinal loading is... Uh, you know, putting a big heavy barbell on our back and squatting as heavy as we can probably isn't a good idea for longevity. Um, if we have shin splints, just attack in this soleus, this kind of, uh, this piece right behind the tibia. Um, all right, number one misconception is that CrossFit is good for ultimate players. Look at that shoulder. Look at this guy snatching with a baby. I don't know what this guy's doing. CrossFit's good for ultimate players, right, Melissa Whitmer? I got a little, it's good, to, I haven't seen her in a while, so I was kind of excited. I got a little flustered there. I saw Melissa walk in. So here's the thing about CrossFit is there's so many awesome things that come from CrossFit. It's great for developing community. It gets people moving. It gets people a part of a community, and that's great. It also brought back the Olympic lifts. The Olympic lifts are great. Absolutely great movements, but they're not for everybody. It's, it's a super competitive environment. They've got a great business model. It's super easy to just open a box gym. Uh, it doesn't cost much. You just need bumper plates, barbells, gymnastics rings. Um, 
And one of the best things that CrossFit brought us is this guy. This is my boy Kelly Starrett, and he's uh, mobilitywad.com. Uh, definitely follow him because he's, he's a complete – He's a complete stud. But the negatives is there's so many unnecessary injuries because of ultimate, I mean, because of CrossFit. It's all bilateral, heavy, push as hard as you can movements. And the big thing is ultimate players are completely, absolutely asymmetrical. Okay? Therefore, we need to do a lot of one arm, one leg movements to balance out our body. You can't do that with a barbell. Barbells are going to be. It's just you're just adding strength on top of dysfunction. I bet you if you look at the bulk of ultimate players squatting, they're going to shift to one side. So CrossFit says, well, whatever. I'm not going to correct that. I'm just going to put as much weight on your back as can and let you squat like this all day and then yell at you to, to keep going and keep going and keep going. And people get hurt, and then I get more work because I, uh, I have to fix them. So it's also got no periodization. It's completely random. Ultimate players, we're training for, to peak. We're training to perform at a certain competition. So our workouts should resemble that. We should fluctuate volume and intensity. We should be programming to meet a peak. And, and CrossFit just says, no, we're just going to throw up a random workout today, and you guys are going to do the random workout, and, uh, and we're going to get better. So that kind of segues into bigger, faster, stronger philosophy that everybody needs to squat, bench press, and do deadlifts from the floor. And me, I'm guilty of it. I think, I mean, it, it, I guess it, it, it's an ego thing or whatever it is, but just picking up as much weight as you can uh, is something I spend a lot of time doing. But look, we're, we're, not, Olympic, uh, we're not Olympic lifters. We're not power lifters. They, these are power lifters. That's Louis Simmons. That's Jake Putin. Th those guys are power lifters. We're not. We have to address asymmetry because these are what we see in ultimate. These are the common uh, you know, asymmetries. We see an external rotation bias. We step out. We have to open the torso. So we externally rotate our hips so we can throw the disc. We... Uh, we rotate with one side when we throw backhands. We tend to jump off of one foot. When I measure verticals on one leg and the other leg, there's a big discrepancy between the two. We pivot, and a lot of us are missing hip internal rotation. So those are all things that we need to think about. Sometimes that's stuff that we need to fix in every day when we're training in our program. So if we only did CrossFit, we wouldn't be addressing any of that. We'd just be cementing those patterns in and setting ourselves up to hurt ourselves eventually. It's not a good idea. <clears throat> so we need to adopt this model of the maximum possible benefit with the least possible load, especially for longevity. Ultimate players want to, you guys want to play ultimate till you're 50. We want to, we want to have a long career.